We have made the passage from life to death, and yet our work is not done. How do we understand who and where we are? Perhaps we never will. But we do step forward in grace toward love. We do walk the tightrope of this life in faith. You are our balance, God. When we teeter, you write us. We surrender to you, loving God. Your hand upon us brings sure direction to our scattered steps. Please pray with me. Patient God, in Easter's light, the world shines more vividly. Within this great good news, we are a little dizzy. Who are we now in the freedom of this abundant life? We thought we had come to the end, only to find that we are smack in the middle of all that you call us to do. May our focus be true. May we see the world truly through a holy lens. And may we always choose your flourishing life. Amen. invite you to take a moment to take a deep breath and then let it go to feel in your bones the good gravity of God holding you on this planet that you are in a place where you are safe and loved may you wake to the day I thought I would take a moment to share the Earth Day prayer, because it is April, when we celebrate the bounty and beauty of our planet, but also its challenges, when it is in your bulletin. We hold everyone who suffers from storms and droughts intensified by climate change. We hold all species that suffer. We hold world leaders delegated to make decisions for life. We pray that the web of life may be mended through courageous actions to limit carbon emissions. We pray for right actions for adaptation and mitigation to help our already suffering Earth community. We pray that love and wisdom might inspire our actions and our, my actions and our actions as communities 
so that we may, with integrity, look into the eyes of all living beings and truthfully say, we are doing our part to care for them and the future of the children. May love transform us and our world with new steps toward life. Amen. And may we hold all that beauty and richness and abundance in gratitude. And hold it in God's peace. So may the peace of Christ be with you. Now I invite any young people who would like to come up and have a bit of conversation with me to come forward. You don't have to sit really, really far away from me. I promise I won't hurt you. <laughs> Hello, it's so great to see you. So I'm gonna tell you a story about when I was a kid, something that happened with my brother. Which of you have brothers and sisters? All of you. Is it always easy to get along with your brothers and sisters? Oh, Robert, you answered very quickly. <laughs> So I'm not encouraging you to try this at home, but this is what my brother did one day. I was playing with him in one of the bedrooms in our house, and he rolled up some paper, and then he went, ow, ow, Elizabeth, stop hitting me. Ow, mom, mom, Elizabeth is hitting me. Do not do this at home. <laughs> not giving you a trick to do. So of course my mother came running down the hall and she got really mad at me and I got a spanking, which is what they did in those days. And so what do you think I did? I got mad at my mother. I was mad at my brother, but got really mad at my mother. And then what do you think happened with my mother? She got even more mad at me. So do you think it would have been better if I had calmly said to my mother, I didn't do anything to Chris? Yeah, it wouldn't have been. But I got really excited because I was upset. And then I just got in more trouble, which is the way humans are. Now, we have just read some stories about Jesus where some really unfair things happened to him. And one of them is that his friend betrayed him, his disciple and friend, and then he got arrested and one of his other friends, do you know this story? Do you know it, Maddie? Do you know what happened? Well, there were some soldiers that came to arrest Jesus and one of his friends was very upset and got very excited, like we will do as humans. And he got out his sword and he lashed out with his sword and he cut off a slave's ear, a servant's ear. Not a soldier, but a servant's ear. What do you think Jesus did? Any ideas? Did he start screaming at the soldiers and at his friend who did that? Cut it out, man. This is terrible. You bunch of idiots. Is that what Jesus did? He healed the man's ear. And he told his friend, put the sword away. That's not what we're doing here. So I think for me, the lesson of that is even when you're really stressed, even when what's going on is really unfair, the story, the lesson we learn from Jesus is, we try to be kind. We try to listen and be kind. So, maybe you guys can talk about that story later. Do not hit objects with rolled up rolls of paper and say that you are being punished by your brother. And how about if we... <laughs>
Robert, I'm so sorry. How about if we take a moment in prayer? God, you teach us that even when we're very stressed, there's a place where you are with us and we can stay calm and sure of your love and we can practice being patient and kind the way you are. Help us all, whether we are still in school or very, very grown up, to remember that and to keep practicing our kindness. May you be with us and give us wisdom, but also joy and plenty of opportunity to play. Bless each of these children. May your love shine on them every day. Amen. So if you would like to go off to Sunday school now, and we are so excited to have Sunday school today. Thank you. There are three scripture readings this morning. The first is from John, chapter 18, verses 4 through 11. Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so if you're looking for me, let those people go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. 
Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? The second scripture is from Luke, chapter 23, verses 39 through 43. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed, So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself, and us too, while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, Don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. And the third reading from Luke 24, verses 28 through 31. As they approached the village in which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Thus endeth the reading. Thank you, Jeannie. May the words of my mouth and all our collective wisdom and experience open in this moment here in our conversation, in our holy conversation with you, God. Amen. As Christians, we move through a ritual year with our high points at Christmas, the birth of Jesus, and Lent's long meditative season when we remember Jesus' time in the wilderness, something that we, in our human lives, end up wandering in our own wildernesses, and then Holy Week, which moves through the sadness and pain of Good Friday and culminates in Easter. And because of its ritual shaping, we have pretty marked boundaries between seasons in the Christian year, and after the tumult of Holy Week, we find ourselves in Easter season through all the complexities and distress as though it had vanished. You can even see this in the liturgical colors. Lent is purple, Good Friday is black, and then poof, Easter is white. All the sin and sadness washed away. This works as ritual time, but it's good for us to remember that life is really made up much more of between times than of discrete and definitive events. And so this week, I want to try to slow that calendar down a little bit and start before the crucifixion and look at three between-time incidents that tell us a great deal about Jesus and therefore a great deal about how we can be Christian people in these between-times. Remember that the gospel accounts insist that Jesus knew what was coming as he came into Jerusalem for Passover. And whether you want to take that literally as a kind of supernatural knowledge and foretelling, or just as the astute discernment of a man, Jesus was aware that he was heading into crisis and suffering. Giving all the many things that Jesus was experiencing simultaneously how did he retain his spiritual integrity? Which is a, a question for us as well. If we accept that Jesus was fully human, he must have felt fear, anxiety, the pain of betrayal, adrenaline, exhaustion. But it's what he did in the midst of those powerfully challenging emotional and physical states that gives us God's lens on his life and what was going on, on where God is even in the worst moments. The first moment that I want to consider happened before the crucifixion, I discussed it a little bit with the kids, when Jesus had been praying in the garden, and that was a place of haven and familiarity for him. So you would think that he could have let down a little bit there, but Judas knew that this was one of Jesus' favorite places. 
And so he and the disciples are confronted there, not only by Judas, but by a detachment of soldiers and Jewish officials. Jesus' private place, so there's a man who's basically homeless, but he has this kind of sanctuary place, has been breached by a group of people who come with torches and weapons. So imagine how you might respond in such a situation. So first I want to note that Jesus did not say a word of reproach to Judas. Instead, his first instinct was to protect his disciples. He asked the invaders, who is it that you want? And when they respond, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus says, I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. He steps forward so that his followers can step back into the shadows, into safety. But our impulsive friend Peter lunges forward with a sword and is so reckless that he doesn't even strike a soldier or high priest, but the priest's slave, Malchus, cutting off his ear. Jesus rebukes Peter. Put away your sword. I have to do what I have to do as called by God. In a violent moment, Jesus turns away from violence. In Luke 22, we learn further that after Malchus was injured, Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched Malchus's ear and healed him. So in this in-between moment, how significant that Jesus' last act before he was arrested was an act of healing. What if we carried the light of this act forward into the days ahead? When all seems to be lost, Jesus stops the rupture from becoming more traumatic, and we are visited with a healing. The next part of the story that really caught my attention this year when I was rereading through the Easter story was the moment on the cross when Jesus is in agony, among others who are in agony. And one of the men, even in this extreme moment, musters his remaining energy to mock Jesus and to provoke him. Oh, you're so high and mighty. Then save yourself, and how about saving us too? You could say that this was the anger and the pain of a person in extremis. But then another man, also in extremis, says, why are you going after him? He hasn't done anything wrong. Jesus, remember me in the next life. And once again, Jesus, in the most painful and precarious state possible, does not lash out, which is, would be a very understandable human thing to do. He does not rebuke the man who tried to goad him. Instead, he responds to the other man, saying, I promise you that we will be together in heaven today. Jesus conveys in one sentence that there is a promise that even the most compromised person can count on, and that is union with God that transcends our human limits and understanding. In other words, when all doors are quickly closing, even the door of life, Jesus opens it with a welcome. These quick references in the lead up to Jesus' death should take a more prominent place in our consciousness. And then there's Jesus' life after the resurrection. And this is understandably a time of a lot of confusion. Did Jesus really come back to life? Did we really see him? How can we understand what is not understandable? In one of my favorite stories in the Bible, some disciples are leaving Jerusalem after Passover and after the death of Jesus. They are grieving. They're trying to talk through what happened when another traveler joins them. He asks after what has happened, they tell him, and as they walk, he begins to talk about God in a way that they have never heard before. He uses the scriptures that they have relied on to open up the nature of God. Something powerful, something mysterious is afoot. 
And when they get home to Emmaus, this enigmatic man makes as though to continue on, but they urge him to pause and join him for a meal and to spend the night. And in the simplest of acts, the man breaks the bread and gives thanks for it, and then shares it with them. This is enough for a revelation. Suddenly, they recognize that their traveling companion is Jesus himself, and with that, he disappears from their sight. These disciples are indeed in the in-between time, traveling from one place to the next, sad and confused, and in some real sense, they are lost. What brings them back to themselves, what brings them home to having their needs met, for consoling conversation, for food, is this man. But note also that God is revealed when the man gives thanks. Jesus teaches us here that gratitude is revelation. Gratitude does reveal the goodness of the world in which we live. And therefore, in this case, it revealed Jesus. This is Jesus in the in-between times, not carrying out his active ministry, but compromised in the world's terms, almost unrecognizable. And yet the message of this in-between time is of the deep importance of these moments when our resources may be limited, our confidence shaken, our public standing diminished. Jesus guides us with all the generosity of faith at exactly those times. This week I was remembering an experience I had with a man I really loved named Bobby, who's no longer alive, but he was living on the street in Boulder. I worked really closely with him. He had been hospitalized, he was found on the street on a really cold night, um, at risk of dying of exposure. He was taken to the hospital, they warmed him up for like two hours, and then kicked him out again in sub zero weather. Shame on us as a culture that we would do that to a human being. I found him and he was quickly going back into hypothermia and I was working with some police officers and so they let him sit in their car and warm up for a while. And while we were there, his mother called him on his cell phone. He didn't tell her what he'd just been going through. He said, Mom, you had your cataract surgery. How are your eyes? You doing okay? She had no idea. And I really see Jesus in that moment, that in-between moment when he was radically compromised, but he had the grace to love another person. Many of you will know the writing of Henry Nouwen, and perhaps most especially his book, The Wounded Healer. In that book, Nouwen writes from his own experience and from studying Jesus' life about using one's own wounds in empathy and the service of others, kind of like my friend Bobby. Nouwen observed, our service will not be perceived as authentic unless it comes from a heart wounded by the suffering about which we speak. Thus, nothing can be written about ministry without a deeper understanding of the ways in which people of faith make their own wounds available as a source of healing. Keep in mind that Jesus' journey was, by anyone's terms, extremely humiliating, and yet he did not absorb the shame. In this trio of stories, we see him for who he is when, after so much travail, he gives thanks. Jesus does not set himself apart from other human beings, not because of his special powers or his special trauma. There is a self-awareness in him and a humility that is urgently needed in our culture and our practice of faith. As Nouwen says, nobody escapes being wounded. We are all wounded people, whether physically, emotionally, mentally, or spiritually. The main question is not, 
How do we hide our wounds so we don't have to be embarrassed? But how can we put our woundedness in the service of others? When our wounds cease to be a source of shame and become a source of healing, we have become wounded healers. I feel that culturally we've been on an unfolding journey around trauma. And a very insightful book by Judith Herman called Trauma and Recovery describes how our culture does tend to hide and disacknowledge trauma. Between wars, we are likely to forget our veterans or offer them little in the way of support. Women's experience of sexual violence or the everyday effects of racism get ignored or disputed or even mocked. Recovery has to do with witnessing to this trauma, calling out the truth and working for recovery. But since so many of us, virtually all of us, have lived with trauma in one form or another, I see an emerging second stage in our culture. That is, we start by naming the trauma as real, and then we go on to say that an individual is not limited to or defined by the worst things that have happened to them. Nowen's Wounded Healer guides us to an understanding of how, having found healing, we can redeem our suffering to build a more whole and united community. Which is to say, everybody heals in their own time as well. But I think the truth is, as humans, we're always in the in-between times. We are always negotiating many things, often without fully understanding all the factors, including our own needs as well as those of others. Jesus walks ahead of us on that uneven, precarious path. We see through his actions that there is a possibility of remaining compassionate and inclusive even when we are afraid or suffering. He models a way of gratitude when we may not even know exactly what we're giving thanks for. I struggle when I'm stressed to stay in touch with God's care for me and with my supportive connection with others. Each week, we pause and we wish each other the peace of Christ. And this Easter season, may we claim it, rely on it, and enact that peace. And I don't mean to say that that will be easy. Peace and compassion aren't necessarily easy even when we're feeling great, but they are the way of Jesus and therefore of Jesus' followers. The practical, earthy Saint Teresa of Avila offers us this reassurance on this count. She says, just because the soul sits in perpetual peace does not mean that the faculties of sense and reason or do or the passions. There are always wars going on in the other dwellings of the soul. There is no lack of trials and exhaustion. But these battles rarely have the power anymore to unseat the soul from her place of peace. So peace be with you in the in-between times.
This is our time of sharing joys and concerns. If you have a prayer concern that you would rather not speak aloud, you're invited to put it in one of the little folders in the pew and put it in the collection plate, and we will pray earnestly on your concern. You're also invited to spend a moment over here lighting a candle if you would like to do that. Um, we do have some prayer requests and thoughts. We want to pray in support and joy for Anne and Fred who are traveling in the Holy Land. Uh, it's a tense time there, but may they come back with uh, insights and wisdom to share with us. I um, also want to pray for Carl Walker who's been having medical problems and I heard from Joy that there's some frustration that they can't quite figure out what's going on. So may his medical providers be discerning and support him through this and bring him to health and resolution. Um, we are also praying for Rod and Pat Milnes. Um, many transitions, Rod's back has been very painful and he's at ProMedica right now, but coming home and so their life circumstances are changing a little bit as they need some more assistance. So we pray for relief from pain and the grace of moving into a different situation. Um, are there other prayers that people would like to share? There was another shooting in Alabama. This was on the news this morning, it's almost a daily event. And so whenever we can, we need to support people who are working for sane gun laws. Hopefully that helps. In a moment of joy, we can say Justin and Justin are back in the Tennessee legislator, le legislature and may they work on, on all of our behalf for saner gun laws. Karen. Um, our son-in-law has um, heart surgery on Thursday, and it's sort of an ongoing thing since he was born. But anyway, prayers would be appreciated. And so thrilled to see all the kids. Will, we are praying for Will and his heart. Do you have something good to tell us about? Um, so first of all, I'd like to introduce Katie. We're gonna be getting married in June. <laughs> Second of all, she's as embarrassed as I am. Thank you. We are so happy for you. So blessings on your life together. Just open our hearts to God. God, in a perplexing, distressed world, we begin by giving thanks. We give thanks for the health of the people whom we love. We give thanks for this miraculous possibility of healing that so frequently comes to us. We give thanks that we can love each other and commit our lives to each other. We give thanks for the green growing things and for the ways the drought has lessened so deeply this year. In all that we have to give thanks for, we open our hearts to the suffering of others to those who have suffered from gun violence, and may we use our outrage as creative energy towards resolving this problem. We give thanks for bold elected officials who speak out. We 
also pray for our wounded plants and animals that this Creation Justice Month, this Earth Month, we can revel in the beauty of your creation and put our shoulders to preserving it, learning the glories, the needs of the planet, and helping to restore it. We continue to pray for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine, for all those who live under dictatorial governments, for our brothers and sisters in Syria and Turkey who are still so profoundly affected by the earthquake. And now we pray for our brothers and sisters in Sudan. May there be a speedy reconciliation and healing of the rifts in the world, the political rifts. Show us how to be your sane and loving people in the in-between times. Our prayers are global and local. We pray for Carl and Pat and Rod. We pray for Will as he goes into surgery. And God, in this loving and quiet space, we know that you hear many unspoken prayers. Hear them now. Accompany our prayers into your heart Give them the power to make a difference. And as followers of Jesus, we pray each week the prayer that he taught us. Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, I want to now invite anybody who has announcements to share, to share announcements. I thought you might have something to say, Nancy. It's finally climate week, and this today is the first showing of the video, which is, it's a great video, very powerful. Um, it, this section that we're showing today is 37 minutes, so it's not an hour and a half. Um, food is up there, so please come up and get a snack and then move um, toward the screen. Um, Trey and Ertha have prepared the fellowship food, so um, please come on up and um, join us. Uh, this episode is on the power grid and how it is outdated for um, expansion to electric power. So um, please come and take a look. Thanks. Thank you for all your work on that, too. I love you. So Winter Nights is starting May 1st here. and. Um, the, the really good news is everybody has signed up for food, so we're in really good shape on food. What we aren't in good shape on is people staying overnight. So if anybody is willing to come camp out in our library for one night during between May 1st and 15th, let me know. You know, it could be fun to have a library to yourself overnight. I um, guess who I'm going to introduce. The next AMCA reading is on the 7th of May. Usually we're on the second Sunday, but um, it's some Father's Day, Mother's Day, one of those. <laughs> we always do. So uh, again, Alice and Landa, who we weren't able to see the last time, is going to be in the house talking about her new book, Bearded Lady. Allison is her suit, and anyone who's had to deal with something that makes them different from everyone else and visibly different from everyone else will really relate to her story. I'm also going to say hello to my friend Pat, and she's also your friend Pat, because she owns the bookstore down in, a, in Arinda Village, and so you've probably been there, and we're just grateful for the work that she does for books and authors and for the community, because there's no community without a bookstore and a church, is, is, in my opinion. So. <laughs> Welcome, Pat. I knew I recognized you. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome all our visitors. 
Um, I wanted to let you know next week is Scout Sunday, so it will be a bit different. I will be away next week, so um, we are grateful that we have Bev to help kind of hold the space and many people participating, so gratitude, and that will be followed by brunch and the second installment of our um, climate justice study. So please be here for that. I don't see any other, oh, but because I will be gone on Thursday, we are not having the reading group or theology and scripture. As you may have noticed, gratitude has often been my theme. I find gratitude life-saving. And so may in our gratitude, we reach out to God, recognize the presence of God, and share our life with others so that their lives may be saved as well.
Loving one, may these gifts serve you, serve us, make the world richer and brighter, and bring us joy of gratitude. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. We're adding a verse to this next hymn. So it starts with, I woke up this morning with my mind. The second one is singing and praying with my mind. The one we're adding is gonna be walking and talking with my mind. And then we'll go back to verse two, singing and praying with my mind. That was our benediction. <laughs> but now I offer you this Cherokee prayer. So may it additionally bless you. Peace and happiness are available in every moment. Peace is every step. We shall walk hand in hand. There are no political solutions to spiritual problems. Remember, if the creator put it there, it is in the right place. The soul would have no rainbow if the eyes had no tears. So may you be blessed, peace in every step, and many rainbows. <laughs>